Good evening and welcome to the New School and tonight's event, which has a couple different names, but it's going to be the same thing. Uh, you know it as Teaching Pronunciation, Seven Essential Concepts, also known as Teaching Spoken English, Simplicity is Key, with the one and only Judy B. Gilbert who we are very honored to have with us tonight. Um, I'm Caitlin Morgan, Director of English Language Studies here at the New School. And two years ago, I recall in the planning phase of this ELT professional development speaker series, we were brainstorming and trying to think, well, what is it that people really want? And I conducted a survey, an informal one, but to about, I don't know, 150 or so teachers, some of you out there, I think probably participated in this, and asking them what topics they would most want addressed in a professional development workshop. What would they come out for on a weeknight from six to eight o'clock at the new school? And you can probably see where this is going. The number one response unanimously across the board, and this is from teachers teaching in totally different contexts, was pronunciation. Um, so it's no surprise that this is such a fantastic turnout tonight. Um, pronunciation is the thing that students always want more of, and I think teachers always feel a certain insecurity about, a uh, little unsure of how to go beyond their limited repertoire of exercises. So we are particularly pleased to be able to respond to the resounding call for more ideas uh, and help in teaching pronunciation, and to do so with someone so well-known and highly regarded and accomplished as Judy Gilbert. So, Judy, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. <laughs> of course, we, we couldn't do this without Cambridge University Press, so. Yes, um, this is our first time partnering with Cambridge University Press, and it has been such a pleasure to work with them. Um, and I particularly have to thank Tom Dare, who is our regional ELT sales rep. If you don't know him, you should. Wave your hand. There he is. He's your book guy. He'll connect you to the goods. Um, who has been just so positive and proactive and key to this event happening tonight. So thank you, Tom. Um, and finally, I love that Cambridge, our colleagues at Cambridge brought to the table another idea for ways to expand the professional development aspect of this evening. And to tell you a little bit more about that, I'd like to introduce um, Cheryl, Cheryl Olinsky-Borg, um, the publishing manager of ELT at Cambridge University Press. Cheryl. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the new school. My name is Cheryl Olinsky-Borg, and I'm the publishing manager, a short one at that, at Cambridge University Press. We're delighted to have such a wonderful turnout here this evening. And in just a few moments, you're going to hear and take part in what's sure to be an incredibly enjoyable presentation from an experienced and very successful author, Judy Gilbert. Ms. Gilbert is an internationally respected authority on teaching English pronunciation. She's a teacher herself and a teacher trainer and author. Judy's come to speak to all of us tonight from her home in the Bay Area of California. And please also join me in welcoming Judy's husband, Jerry. Jerry, where are you in the room? Hi, Jerry. <laughs> and her granddaughters, Dominique and Andrea. to the new school. I know they're very excited and very proud to be here supporting Judy Gilbert tonight. And it is our hope that gathered here in this room tonight, there may be others who have considered materials writing. Have any of you written materials for use in your classroom? Anybody? Most of you? Have any of you published materials before with a publisher? Show of hands, a few. Great. Well, for those of you who have published, Scott Thornberry in the back of the room, one great example, you know what a collaborative and exciting experience publishing can be. And it's our hope that after seeing and hearing from Ms. Gilbert tonight, you might also be inspired to share your teaching experience and ideas with the rest of the ELT world. Publishing is a wonderful way to help other instructors learn from your experience about what works in the classroom and what doesn't. And in your handouts tonight, you'll find one that's entitled ELT Proposal Submissions Guidelines. It looks something like this. And 
And we've put this handout together as a reference for you. Because interested writers often ask us, or say to us, I've thought about writing a proposal, but how do I get started? How do I get started writing a book? And in this handout, you will see what we are looking for in a proposal and where to send it. Potential writers will often ask us, well, what sells best? And what types of materials do you need? I can write them for you. Well, unfortunately, there's no simple or magic answer to that question. But the real answer is many different types of materials are needed, and a variety of different types of books sell well. But I would share with you a little bit of advice from my years of experience in language publishing to help guide you. In preparing a product proposal, you must remember your ABCs. A is for appropriate. Make sure the materials are appropriate for use in a wide variety of ELT classrooms. The broader the potential for use, the more likely that many instructors will say, I want to use this. This will work for me. B is for benefits. Think about the benefits of using your materials. What will the student be able to do after using your materials that he or she couldn't do before? How will these materials improve the student's English language skills? Imagine you had to sell your idea in a 10 second radio commercial. What would you say the benefits are? And C is for clear. Be sure to create an approach that is clear and easy for many different types of instructors with varied backgrounds and experience to follow. Our field is very diverse, and it's likely that the instructors sitting right in front of you and right behind you have very different backgrounds from you. Imagine your materials being used in New York, in New Mexico, and New Zealand. For materials to work in such a variety of places, they must be clear. Judy Gilbert is an author who has followed her ABCs to the letter. And what she will present to us this evening about pronunciation is sure to inspire others to join the ranks of published authors. I'd be happy to talk to any of you um, about getting started in publishing, or you can certainly contact us at Cambridge through the email which is printed on the submissions form. And many of you have also met Tom Dare, our sales rep from Cambridge, who I'd like to thank especially for arranging this evening tonight together with Caitlin Morgan from the New School. And Tom can also speak to you about getting started in materials development. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, John Brzezinski. He's the senior product manager. He'll share some exciting new product news with you tonight, and then he'll turn the microphone over to the star of our show, Judy Gilbert. Thank you. I promise to be brief. Uh, I would, however, like to take care of a few last items of housekeeping. Uh, I'll point out Tom one more time, and just 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 to say that. Uh, that after the program, uh, if you're interested in speaking to Tom about any of, any of the materials that are available, please do so. Also included in your packets is a sample request form for your courses. If, however, you don't have the time to fill that out and give it to Tom while you're here, you can also fill out a, a very similar form online. Just go to cambridge.org slash ESL and you'll see a link for exam copies. Uh, Cheryl spoke a little bit about the future of ELT authorship. I'd like to speak a little bit about the future of ELT materials. Uh, some things that students need will never change. There will always be students in classrooms. There will always be printed books. But in addition to those printed books and in addition to those classrooms, we need to look to meet students where they are and look at learning styles that better meet their needs and desires. And Judy has been on the forefront of this and has created two applications for the iPhone, iPad, or iPod. Uh, these are clear speech apps one for regular clear speech and one for clear speech from the start, with fe which feature games to help students improve their ability to understand differences between key in key areas of pronunciation through fun activities. We've got an iPad right over there. You're more than welcome to check it out. Or, of course, you can visit uh, the iTunes App Store or encourage your students to do so as well. I think that's enough about us, though. Uh, it's, with great pleasure then that I'll t speak just briefly about Judy Gilbert. Uh, for more than 30 years now, Judy has been developing best practices and the materials to put those best practices into action for teaching pronunciation to language learners. In addition to the contribution, 
contributions that she's made to the field through her uh, writings. She's presented at numerous conferences all over the world and continues to share her insights in the best ways to help students be, learn to pronounce uh, through uh, the, the workshops that she leads and of course, most notably, through her best-selling sell, best, best textbook series, Clear Speech and Clear Speech from the Start. Uh, I'd like to put a personal word in here that Judy's a little bit of a hero for me uh, because I, of course, learned how to teach pronunciation having received no training in it by using her books. Uh, then I'll go ahead and turn it over now. I ask you to please join me in welcoming Judy Gilbert. Now, am I on? No, I mean, is the, okay, the sound on. <laughs> well, actually, most people for the last 50 years have not been trained to teach pronunciation. This is not an uncommon problem, and that's why I give these workshops. So I'm going to see if I can. I gave you copies of all the slides so you don't have to write anything unless you want to make extra notes. And especially for those on the side, <laughs> I'm glad I put them in your handout. Except I can't read that, so I'll read it from here. <laughs> <laughs> These are the standard problems that people will explain why they don't have pronunciation in the curriculum. There's not enough time. Well, there's never enough time for everything that our students need. So the answer is pretty obvious, seems to me, is you've got to prioritize and only teach the things that have the most power. Then there's a problem of fear of alienation, and that means people who are immigrants in particular who live within a group tend to fear losing their place in the group, and pronunciation is at the heart of it because grammar is just difficult and, and vocabulary just goes on forever, but pronunciation is who we are, who our people are. So there's a heavy emotional connection. And what has to be in the mind of the teacher is not accent reduction. That's a common expression, particularly in commercial outfits that are selling their services. Accent reduction sounds like stain removal. But my Swedish colleague has come up with a much better uh, name for what we do, accent addition. And what that means is we give the students the ability to switch codes depending on who they're talking to. If they're talking to the people in their uh, home community, OK. But if they're looking for a job, or something else, or even just want to buy something from a clerk, it's handy to be able to know how to be clear for that person. So this is a practical matter. And when students learn that it's purely a practical matter and not a question of their wrong and somebody else is right, which has got a whole psychological problem about it, this is practical. And I think students respond to that. The teacher has to understand it's not a matter of correcting their errors, but helping them know how to adjust if there's been a communication breakdown when they're talking to an English speaker. All right, discouragement. Now, that's a big thing for adults. I don't know if children think about that, but adults, certainly immigrants, think about it because they're tired. They may be working. They practice something they've learned in class, and they practice it with a native speaker in some work situation, and it doesn't work because the other person says, excuse me? Then the learner repeats it, and the other person might say, I'm sorry, I didn't understand, but there will never be a third chance. They've got to know how to fix it. As soon as they see that frown, that puzzlement, because nobody that I know of is going to be willing to embarrass the situation by saying, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. So 
we need to help our students learn how to fix a breakdown. And they do that by finding out the kind of transfer from their own language they are likely to have made unconsciously. All right. So the answer to discouragement is learnable tasks. And that means uh, lightening the learning load. That must be true of all teaching. But I just think about it in my terms, that we can't teach everything that's ever been figured out about English pronunciation. That's a whole field of phonetics. And we have to choose just to teach one thing at a time and then gradually build them together. That's what learnable tasks are, something that doesn't overwhelm the student with too much difficulty. It's a very important pedagogical principle, I think. And the fourth problem is they need, they urgently, particularly the low-level people, they urgently need to be able to decode print. Because if they can't guess how the print is pronounced, they can't take the stuff we give them in class and go home and practice it. They need the teacher there. So, and the answer to that is practical spelling rules. I'm not going to have time today to give my take on what are practical spelling rules. That is, phonic rules that have been adapted for ESL. Because regular phonic rules that we use in our elementary school classes don't work so very well for ESL for various reasons. But I've given you four pages after the, the, the PowerPoint slides that you can look at that later. And hopefully that will be of help. OK, I want to go on. The reason I say simplicity is the key. We need to make the learning burden light. We need to teach only the highest priority issues. And if there's more time, so good, teach more. Now, what's the goal? I love this. It just came, I was reminded of it just a little while ago, to tune the harmony. And what that means, it's from Shakespeare, who knew a lot about language. And he said, and now my tongue, oh, this is, sorry, I have to play, tell you. This person has just been told he is exiled for life away from England to a foreign country for life. And he says, and think about the immigrants. And now my tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or a harp, or like a cunning instrument cased up or being open, put into his hands that knows no touch to tune the harmony. And I want to talk to you today about the harmony of English. Each language has its own music, and it matters. Now, this is from a, this is from a uh, researcher into how the brain functions. He says, a linguistic melody is a group of tones that work together to get a job done, which I thought was neatly put. I've given you in the little uh, references, that book is about the brain function for music and language, and he's an expert in both. And, and it's not easy reading, but it's very interesting. All right, I'd like to dictate two sentences to you. I'll read, I'll say each one of them twice. This is sentence A. Write it anywhere, it doesn't matter. John said, the boss is an idiot. John said, the boss is an idiot. Sentence B. John said the boss is an idiot. John, said the boss, is an idiot. Did you put punctuation in? So who's speaking in the first sentence? Who's speaking in the second sentence? I didn't dictate punctuation. Now think about your students. Typically, they have not been trained to listen for the musical cues See, punctuation is just a crude form of showing the music of the language. And those cues are obviously important. That's how you know who's saying what. That's how you group things together. That's what punctuation's for. But it matters.
for listening comprehension. And it matters for, for intelligibility, because if the student doesn't know about this whole musical signaling system, they're going to be hard to understand. I mean, this is assuming they've also got some grammar errors and a few other things to complicate matters. All right, let's go on. Prosody is a term that I use to cover. I don't care what the people who teach poetry use it to mean. I, it's timing for me, timing and pitch patterns, rhythm and melody, intonation, super segmentals. Now, segmentals are the individual sounds. And most people, if they teach pronunciation at all, drill individual sounds. But the super segmentals is the carrier music that forms the sounds together. And in fact, the sounds can become distorted by the need for that carrier music to show emphasis, basically. So super segmentals are very important. But I use the term prosody also. And you'll run into it in all kinds of articles. All right, prosody matters. And here's a little bit more literature <laughs> from, <laughs> from uh, a passage to India. A pause in the wrong place, an intonation misunderstood, and the whole conversation went awry. I was looking for that to remember where it was in my copy of A Passage to India, and I couldn't find it till the very end. Because in fact, it sums up some of the basic meaning of the book. These cultures constantly misunderstood each other over and over. So this captures some of this, a pause in the wrong place, an intonation misunderstood. All right. So that's why I call this the prosody pyramid. This is the system I think makes it possible for your students to understand how it all fits together. Uh, I don't know if you people inside can see this. The thought group is the foundation. Thought group is a, a short sentence or a clause or a phrase. That's the base, the foundation on which this whole system is built. In each thought group, mind you, it can be a short sentence. It can be part of a sentence that's long, clause. Each one, there's going to be a focus word. I mean, there are a lot more technical terms for that, but I think the idea of focus makes sense to me. It's what you want your listener to focus on. It's the main word in the sentence. All right, in each focus word, there is a primary stress syllable. If it's a long word with many syllables, there may be more than one stress, but there's one primary stress. Your students need to know how words are stressed, if they're going to be understood easily. When a word is misstressed, if it's an important one, that will make the native speaker, listener anyway, stop and think, what was that? And they lose track of the whole, the thing breaks down then. So that, that stressed syllable has to be clear and what makes it clear? The vowel at the center of that syllable. That vowel has to be clear. It has to be lengthened in time so that the listener notices. And there has to be a change of pitch. That's the peak of information, that vowel. That means you don't have to fix every single thing. In fact, if you try to fix a breakdown, and fix every single sound, you've lost the listener. Because it English communication depends on this system. All right, so I'm going to go on with it, with this prosody pyramid. Here's the problem. All the elements of the prosody pyramid are interdependent. They tend to occur at the same time. And obviously, we can't teach everything at the same time. This is a pedagogical problem. So what to do? They are interrelated. They are not independent. The solution is template sentences. 
Now, repetition has gotten a bad name for a long time. And teachers say, students get bored. Their minds switch off. Well, not if it's quality repetition. So I put the word quality. Actually, I got that from my physical trainer. He said, can you please make this a quality repetition? <laughs> and instantly, I thought, that's the expression I was looking for. Completely, of course, not paying attention to what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> but if you use choral repetition to establish the mastery of a chunk of English, like a little song, then you can use that chunk later. That goes into long-term memory if there's a quality repetition, enough of it. That goes into long-term memory that the student then has in their own mind. They don't need a recording. They don't need the teacher. They go back and run it, that little tape in their mind. That's what long-term memory gives them, the ownership of this chunk. And then you can analyze different parts of it. A chunk, a little song. Uh, how many of you have studied French? Quite a few. My guess is that, that when your first year of French, you could easily learn what qu'est-ce que c'est means. Qu'est-ce que c'est? That's three syllables, right? Qu'est-ce que c'est? Easy to learn. You can respond when the teacher says qu'est-ce que c'est. You can answer. However, look at the grammar of that. <laughs> if that is taught from the standpoint of piecing together the grammar parts, <laughs> you get the point. However, it was easy to learn to say it and respond to it if you think of it as a word with three syllables. That's what chunk learning means, or well, there are a lot of terms for that. But if you learn this complicated thing as one little sum. You've got it and you possess it. Later, later the teacher can point out the different grammatical parts. That's for later. OK. Why repetition? It's to build long-term memory. And this is a very old, from 1949, classic line from, edu from uh, it isn't really education, but from psychological psychology research, the neurons that fire together wire together. I love it because it gets back to this thing, like the qu'est-ce que c'est? It's a, it's a, a mastered piece that sticks together. All right. And for an example of a template sentence. It's important that the students hear it a lot before they're allowed to speak. So they should be eager to speak. And it's, how do you spell easy? 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 It's heard all different kinds of ways, but always at the same speed. If it's slowed down, you're going to lose the essence of it, because these signals are tied together as a little song. So try it with me. How do you spell easy? 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 And a lot of times, of course, we're not going to take time for it now. And besides, you are competent English speakers. So I have twice given workshops with my Swedish colleague. And he does this in Swedish, which works a lot better. Because what happens is the audience, who doesn't speak Swedish, most of them, begins to realize, after a while, you begin to feel stronger. It's not boring. It's strength building. The confidence is built from choral repetition. And why choral? Because you have the support of all the people around you. If you ask someone to recite by themselves, it will all disintegrate, because the person's nervous. and they So that support's terribly important, the choral stuff. And then you can do little groups. And then you can go back and forth from listening. And then you can return to it later to review it. But that you're putting into that long-term memory a template sentence, which you can later start to talk about. For instance, the word order, how do you spell? How do you spell? When they are apt to be saying, how spell you? You've heard that? The word order of do and all that? Well, it's built into this, that grammar. 
And the sounds are built in the way they run together. All right. How can the template be used? And the main point is, of course, one element at a time. Just teaching one of these aspects about the template. Using the template sentence as your model. Thought groups are the foundation. I'm just going to review this. In English, every thought group has a focus word. Every focus word has a primary stress syllable. The peak of meaning is the vowel in this stress syllable. There's a pitch change at this peak vowel. Now that conceptually is the what the whole course as far as I'm concerned. And everything, all the teachers teaching goes into practice of these various elements of this system, because it is a system. And it's not the same system in other languages. Because the peak of meaning, every language has to say, have a way to say, this is what I want you as a listener to pay attention to, this word. But the system is different in different languages. Japanese has a particle at the end, wa. Or German has, so I'm told, I don't speak German, doch, meaning a lot of things. But one thing is, this is important. Sometimes the language puts the most important word at a particular place in the sentence. Every language has to have a way of saying, this is new information or something I want to stress particularly. I want you to notice. It's a signal that goes up to the listener. It is a navigation guide to the listener. Follow me. In English, it is this pyramid with that pitch change on that crucial syllable. And if they haven't, you know, we learn this. We learn the music of our native language by the time we're a year old, theoretically. Most of it. After that, the brain has to concentrate on learning vocabulary and grammar and a whole bunch of other stuff. So that means the little baby, the year old baby, cannot be paying attention to this musical stuff anymore consciously. It has to be in there unconsciously so that the brain can consciously study other things. But that means for the rest of that baby's life, ours, it's going to automatically transfer to any other language Unless we're gifted types, but most people aren't. And so they don't hear that they're not getting it right. They don't know why things are getting confused. Because this is an automatic transfer of the system of the first language. That's why this, it's very helpful for anybody, say, from uh, adolescence up, I don't know about earlier, to call to conscious attention, this is what you need to know. And as a matter of fact, if you're working on another language and want to improve yourself, this is what you need to know about what you're automatically transferring to that new language. So this now, the pitch changes on that syllable. And I've used, I've used a phonetic single, sig, uh, symbol for E up at the top, because that's the main, the peak of information, that vowel. But it doesn't have to go up. How do you spell easy? How do you spell easy is perfectly a, a reasonable way to say it. What it means is that the pitch is changing. There's a, a baseline pitch, and there's a change or down. And a native English speaker, here's the change. Or. So you watch people in a university lecture hall taking notes. The native speakers, if the lecturer is not speaking in a monotone, <laughs> the lecturer will change will have a, the same pitch for major points and maybe a lower pitch for lesser points. And the, and the good note takers will write something down when there's a change of pitch. Meanwhile, the foreign students are trying to write down every word, which, as you know perfectly well, is hopeless. 
And they get discouraged, of course. Now, the first function of intonation is to contrast new information and old information. There are other more technical terms for this, but I think this is handy. When the reporter says, follow that car, the cab driver says, which car? They both know they're talking about a car. The reporter says, <laughs> <laughs> In other words, if it's old, if it's understood between them. Now, what happens when the English learner is trying to be understood? There's an emphasis on every single word. And the listener can't make out what the main point is. So I'd like you to try this. Now, there's only one trick, one trick alone with a kazoo. And it's an interesting psychological problem. It looks like something to blow. But what it does is amplify the uh, vibration in your vocal cords. If you blow, there's no vibration in the vocal cords. So there's no sound. I'm saying this to you because I've been doing this for 30 years, and 10% of you are still going to blow. <laughs> All right, best on the big end. Let's try it all together. Humming. If you have trouble, make ooh or some kind of vowel sound. Okay? <laughs> We've got overtones here. All right. In fact, it's a very good uh, imitation of pitch change. And the terrific thing about it, I call it an inexpensive pitch extractor because I used to mess with uh, pitch extractors when I was studying acoustic phonetics. And they cost a lot of money. They're electronic. But this strips away everything but the pitch change. That's why it's a handy thing. And if you can't find cheap ones individually wrapped, just use it as a signal when you're reminding your students of what they have made an error, because they are apt to, in their effort to be understood, emphasize every word. All right, let's go on a little bit. Uh, the second function of intonation is to separate the thought groups. Tell me, I'm going to read either A or B, and tell me how many things does she like. She likes pie and apples. How many? Two, Two. all right. And the next one, tell me who's speaking. Jane said my dog is clever. The dog. Now, your students are not apt to have heard that signaling. So it matters. And that's, that's the second major function of intonation. Syllables are the building blocks of this pyramid. Some learners drop syllables. This gomment is something I heard a Taiwanese saying, and by the third time I realized he was talking about government. Yes, and he, I assume his problem was he was having trouble with the V and the R, and the solution to that is drop the whole syllable. <laughs> I, I thought, because it was some British thing, that he was talking about garment. Anyway, now, some learners add syllables. You must have a lot of Spanish speakers with the word escuela. That's three syllables, and it's by the rules of Spanish. So they're going to be say, estudiant, you know, es that's required by their language, and they're not hearing it as a syllable because it's just a phonological rule from Spanish. All right. This is a you know what it is. It's a school bus, because it's yellow. <laughs> this is in Kuala Lumpur. I was so delighted to see it. It's one of the few. I'm not much of a photographer, but I had to have this picture. This tells you a little bit about grammar, uh, word order. In uh, See, Bahasa Malaysia is full of English terms because of their history. But notice the word school. That is going according to, that's at least two syllables, maybe three. And they're going according to the phonological rules of their language, a Malaysian language. 
All right. So let's practice how many. And when you teach this, they've got to move physically because rhythm is a physical matter. And it's, you, it's not good enough just to be intellectually understood. Let's go across horizontally and tap something. Foot, pencil, whatever. OK. Say it with me. Ease, easy, easily, six, seven, 70, and so forth. Uh, this is not easy for people whose first language does not work syllables the same way. And yet, if they're getting the syllable number wrong, goodness knows with Japanese. If they're getting the syllable number wrong, it's going to really muddy up their intelligibility. All right, I want you to work on contract. A lot of students are afraid of contractions. They think it's slangy and not good speech. But you listen to uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, unless he's being extra solemn, he's using contractions. Why? Because it's part of the system. You make some things small so that other things can be big and clear. It's a system of contrast. Now, so they, they don't need to use contractions when they speak. Reassure them. It's not necessary. They need to be able to hear them. And the way you learn to hear them is by practicing saying them. And you would hope eventually they'll be able to use them. But at least they'll hear better, because this is a major listening comprehension barrier. All right, I'd like you to, I want to break it up do I always get confused about right and left? I've been doing this for years. All right. Can, not, can't. OK? Let's do it. Can, not, can't. And I would, I'd. I am, I'm. He is, he's. Do you, do. Back to the template. How do you spell? How do you spell? And if they've got that in their mind, they can recognize it. And then when they hear people talking, they will, in fact, be able to pick it up. Otherwise, they've missed some serious information because they haven't been trained to hear it, the contractions. And uh, of course, some of these are in written language, and something like do isn't unless it's in comic strip form, because that's like real language, the spoken language. All right, contrast is the main point. The, uh, it's very hard to see the butterfly in this. But when the butterfly is highlighted and everything else is backgrounded, that's the principle for almost all of the spoken English is contrasting what's to be highlighted and backgrounding everything else. That is the reason for contractions, because it's, an, it's part of the system. It's not us being sloppy, which I've heard some teachers say, we're so lazy. That's not very helpful. It is a system of highlighting and, and backgrounding. All right, now, another way of contrasting is length. And you've got, this is a size 84 uh, rubber band. You can get them at, at uh, uh, office supply places. You can get them from your, your broccoli, if you eat enough broccoli. <laughs> I, uh, clearly, this will not be suitable for junior high school. <laughs> but if you've got good people in your high school classes, it should be OK. <laughs> because this, is the, this and the kazoo are my, the most powerful tools I know of for teaching pronunciation. Because most, many languages have a more or less equal length of time for each syllable. Spanish, Japanese, they're not exactly equal, but they're more or less equal. English depends on having different lengths for different syllables irregular lengths. And therefore, they need to learn to hear it. So they notice. And this is a, an analogy. 
because it's hard for them to lengthen if they're Spanish speakers or Japanese speakers or whatever these languages are that don't lengthen the vowels. So let's try it with banana. Banana. This is hard. The reason I use a strong one is, for one thing, it doesn't break easily, which is frustrating, but also because for people who, for whom this is a difficult task, this is a, a psychological, I don't know, whatever I believe in it anyway, <laughs> but it helps. And I've seen people practicing. I, one of my, I was training, uh, uh, one of my teacher trainees was tutoring a, a woman in her a kitchen, and she had a child on her lap with an arm around. And when she was trying to practice, she was going like this. Nothing was in her hand. But she remembered the sensation of the rubber band. She was trying to help herself lengthen that. And the most important reason for lengthening is the primary stress syllable, where the vowel matters, it has to be lengthened. That lengthening is a crucial part of calling attention. So the hearer notices that vowel. It has to be lengthened. So that's why, that's why, the, the rubber band. Let's try it with these. Do it with me. Easy, easily, excuse me. Doesn't all have to be in the same word. Running uh, syllables will have variable length. Now, there are other reasons for variable length, but the most crucial one is for the peak vowel in the prosody pyramid. All right, let's, we can practice these. But I'd like you to, what do I want you to do here? Let's just do it with a rubber band first, one going horizontally. Easy, spelling, Canada, China. Economy, economical. Notice how there that shifts stress because it's a different part of speech. So it's a crucial part of the pronunciation of the word. All right. English, muffin, instant, coffee. That's the length contrast. Now it is so important for the listener to notice the peak vowel, that there has to be more than one signal. Length is one of them, and clarity is another. Stressed vowels are long and clear. That means that vowel has to be, student learns has to make that vowel clear. It has to be long, it has to be clear. Unstressed vowels, if it's a long word, it's going to have several vowels. They're easy to hear, but they're short and they're clear. But a reduced vowel, popularly known as schwa, is very short, very unclear. It's obscure, deliberately, systematically obscured. When I was uh, giving a workshop for liter literacy volunteers, I love volunteers because it's so positive not only for the people they're helping, but for themselves, because the world is kind of rotten in a lot of ways. And to make your, do something good is a good thing for people, good medicine. Anyway, one of the, I was explaining about the schwa. Schwa is not just another sound. Schwa is a heart of this problem. I was explaining about the schwa, how it gets reduced, and you can't tell what it is. She says, you mean the vowel loses its integrity. <laughs> I said, there's somebody who's really quick on the uptake. <laughs> but I, had, I have a, a Japanese colleague who's a, a, a lovely, very Japanese lady in her manner. She trains elementary school teachers uh, in Japan to teach uh, English. And it's hard for them because they were not English majors. And the Ministry of Education has been pushing English down farther and farther into the elementary school level. So it frightens them. Understandably. Anyway, she explains to them the thing about the schwa is the schwa is a very self-effacing vowel, and she steps aside to let other vowels shine. 
which was another beautiful <laughs> poetic way to put it. All right. But it's a major barrier for people learning uh, English through reading. And one of my teacher trainees, I, I required them all when I was teaching methods courses to teach a lesson before they came to class and then discuss what happened. Everybody had the same lesson, but it went differently depending on what their students were like. And uh, this one said uh, she had a whole, an entire Japanese class. And she said, when we got to Schwa, they were furious. I said, they were furious. She said, yes, we've, they'd been studying English for six, eight years and are good students. And nobody had told them about Schwa. Because it disappears. That's his whole point. It disappears so that other, the primary stress valve, will, by contrast, really show up. It's the contrast that matters. All right. Uh, and the schwa is an upside down E in almost everybody's dictionaries, whatever they use. And it's systematic that almost any vowel can turn into a schwa when it's de-stressed, by contrast with a stressed vowel. And that makes it the most common sound in the spoken language. What a revolting thing for people to find out because it doesn't show up in print. There's no warning. And therefore, if they know the language by reading, they don't know what they're hearing. This is, this is a listening comp thing. All right. Now, again, a contrast is for the focus word. So I'd like you to, I'll do it once and I'd like you to do it. That can you, well, I think you can read in your handout even if you can't see this. Uh, <coughs> Notice how it's changing. If you just have one sentence to practice with, you don't have this ongoing dialogue, and that's what's crucial, because the focus of attention changes in an ongoing conversation. OK, let's try it. Try it with me. First, John. Jane. John. All right, now, because you can do that, with the rubber band and the kazoo, and therefore I can't speak, we're working on coordination and why, because these things, in fact, occur at the same time. Ultimately, you want your students to connect that. All right. Let's try John. OK? Hey. <laughs> OK. Which shows it's possible. Uh, this focus word business is so crucial, I've given you two ways to practice it with the pitch change and with the lengthening of the vowel. But this is called sentence emphasis, or thought group emphasis. So it, it is so crucial for them to learn to automatically hear it. This is listening comprehension, as well as intelligibility. So what I want you to do, instead of using these, is to say it, but put up your hands for the emphasis syllable. OK, I lost my glasses. What kind of glasses? Sunglasses. Green sunglasses. Now, sometimes I ask people to get hold of the chair in front of them and get up a little bit. But I'm always afraid of some kind of a disaster. Somebody <laughs> falls over. But if you've got solid chairs in your classrooms, you can do that. The more things, the more ways you can get people to do this, the better. If you have room and people can move around, you can do what one of my colleagues calls walkabout. And it would be something like, I lost my glasses. 
glasses is a long step or however you do it, but they're walking around and back and forth over and over. Again, this is the repetition thing. You're building it in. You're building the physicality into the sentence. All right. Another way to do it, and this will sound simple, but in fact it's quite challenging, and that is just raise your eyebrows. That's all. <laughs> you really have to concentrate. All right, ready? John, I lost my glasses. Jane, what kind of glasses? John, sunglasses. Green sunglasses. <laughs> Takes concentration, doesn't it? And you can think, I'm sure, of many other physical ways to reinforce this. All right, now, I'm going to, I'm going to, pair practice is one of the best things you can do, be, student pairs, because it takes, if you ask someone to recite alone, or two people, they're nervous, and that wrecks the whole rhythm thing. But if they're working with each other and the teacher's just walking around, they're not paying attention to the teacher, who after all is the expert. Uh, so they're not so intimidated. And this is something like real conversational breakdowns. There are two possible answers. And if the, the person who's designated as student B, the listener, gives the wrong answer, student A knows that it wasn't made clear. So I use this for all kinds of practice. And uh, I will give this with a kazoo. I'd like you to answer with the words as student B. All right, number, and it can't go A, B, A, B, which students have a tendency to do because then there's no challenge to it. This has got to be a challenge. All right, uh, number one, I wanted a cup of soup. Two. We asked for five oranges. Three, I believe that tea is mine. OK, please turn to somebody next to you. I don't know which direction. <laughs> Work it out and practice these. With, your kazoo, with a kazoo and a word answer. OK. Now, here you have, here you have a classic uh, Japanese-style classroom with 200 people in it, making a lot of noise. So this is assuming, of course, you don't have somebody in the next classroom. What happens typically is because a kazoo is such an unfamiliar thing to talk through, people will be unclear which syllable they're changing the pitch on. And therefore, the other person has difficulty identifying it. And that is exactly what happens to our students. Either they're timid and they talk in a monotone and there is no emphasis, or they emphasize every single word and the other person is bewildered, a native speaker. This is assuming your people are trying to speak to native speakers. If they're trying to speak to another, if a Malaysian is speaking to a Japanese, that's a different, I don't, I don't deal with that. I'm dealing with people who are trying to get something out of a native speaker, a raise and pay, or directions how to find a hamburger place, or whatever. And therefore, they need to learn that they have to concentrate their mind and use this musical approach to make clear which word is the emphasis. So it's, it's a very, and you can use this as a symbol when you hear somebody giving the wrong syllable. <laughs> uh, you know, if they've once gotten the idea in their heads, you can just say, uh, <laughs> it's a reminder. All right, if you can somehow get your school to afford it and buy a whole bunch of them, that's even better. But even if you just have one, it's a very useful tool. All right. Now, that's super segmentals. I want to say just a little bit about segmentals. I can't talk about them much. But the first sentence is, uh, he has a lot of money. He has a lot of money.
And then B, he had a lot of money. It makes a difference. You have, I assume, mixed classes with people from all kinds of languages and many languages of the world, Asia, Italian, whatever, don't either have no final consonants or not many. And consequently, from the age of about one year, they've stopped hearing them. That is, they hear them. The ear is normal. It hears them. But the brain doesn't process a final consonant. They may look at it on paper, but they don't hear that they're missing it. How many of you have Spanish speakers who seem to miss final T's or? Yeah. And if they miss a final S, I don't really need an S in Spanish because you've got a, an article before that makes it perfectly clear. But the doesn't make anything clear about whether it's plural or singular or whatever. So these final consonants matter. Uh, truthfully, I forget what the second example was. <laughs> But I think you get the point that those final consonants are crucial, and they're not hearing them. So I would make that a very high priority topic. Peak vowels, I already said, are the peak of information. So uh, how do you spell easy, and how do you spell messy? If they look at that in print, they need to know how to figure out which vowel sound it is, because it's the peak vowel of the focus word. That's what that, set, that question is about. All right. Some sounds are the highest priority. If you try to teach all the sounds that you learned, if you took a phonetics course, which is a good thing to do, but you try to teach all those sounds, you're going to use up what time there is available. It's a non-renewable resource. Not only is time not renewable in, in any classroom, but students' confidence is not renewable. Once they get discouraged because it's too much for them, they're hard to teach, which isn't good for the teacher. OK. So consonants that come at the end of words, oh, I know, the other one had to do with a past tense. Well, that has and had sort of covers it. But consonants that come at the end of words and are spelled with the letters S or D. I would say are the highest priority. Get those before you mess with anything else. That is, they have to learn to hear them. And by the way, the, uh, the brand new clear speech apps are teaching listening for these final sounds. Two of the games, there are four games, but two of the games concentrate on hearing, learning to hear over and over because the games are built. They're supposed to be entertaining, so you keep practicing. And you can play the word over and over and to make sure you learn to hear those final sounds. And those are the sounds that are being practiced there. All right, a summary. Simplicity is the key. This are, these are seven points. Simplicity is the key. Prosody is the framework. Quality repetition builds long-term memory. Thought groups are the foundation. Peak vowels are the peak of information. So the priority sounds are peak vowels and word final grammar cues. Now I've added, because I can't go into it in this short time, how I, my take on how to teach those, the, the vowel quality, the difference between easy and messy when they're both spelled with the letter E. So that's the summary of the whole thing. So now we have time for questions. I think there's a couple of microphones for questions. With raise of hand, anyone? Questions? Here's two. Uh, the iPad, the pronunciation games that they can go online, 
is there any possibility that they can email their results to their teacher, or is that a possibility in the future? <laughs> what a thought. Such a uh, struggle has been gone through for a year now to get the games together. We haven't gone to the next step. They get their, they get their score. Here's the thing. I don't want them to rush. I want them to listen over and over. Then, if they're doing well at it and they think they've got it, then they can turn on a timer to see if they can go through it faster. But how it gets to the teacher, I don't know. And I, I can just respond very briefly by saying, I, this is the, the very first step, but frankly, as technology continues to be easier and easier to use, and as more and more students have greater and greater access to technology, look to Cambridge and look to Judy for the future of a lot of this. <laughs> uh, oh, but, 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 oh, but the, the first question was just, can, can the scores currently be reported to instructors? The answer is no. Hello. Um, so if, if we as teachers have a limited time to teach pronunciation and only pronunciation, I'm getting from your talk tonight that you would focus on um, stress and intonation rather than um, sounds themselves. If you practice individual sounds, you will use up whatever little time you've got. My brother, who a very bright man, when he drove around the freeways in Los Angeles, thought he was improving his Spanish by going <laughs> But you see, it had no context. And context is everything for the individual sounds. When you, with the whole point of this is to call attention to that focus word. And in order to do that, you distort all the sounds around it. They change, they're not gonna be like they are in the dictionary. And that's what is hard for listening comprehension because the students don't recognize what happened to it and they don't know why. But it's a systematic focus on that focus word that changes the sounds. So if you practice the sounds without any timing context, it's an uphill battle. Because the rhythm's wrong, they're gonna bring the rhythm from their first language. I, I met a colleague who had a language school in Portugal and he spent a lot of time doing business in Spain. And he said every time he got back from Spain to Portugal, his rhythm was confused. You cannot make clear Spanish sounds in Portuguese rhythm. That's true of all languages. Because the timing context is what makes the sound clear. And that's why the timing and the rhythm and the intonation matter. OK, another question. If you only have uh, one kazoo, if you can't afford all the kazoos, <laughs> so the uh, students can't really use them in their exercises, any thoughts on how to reinforce the value of the kazoo? You have an a suggestion. Uh, yeah, a comb and a tissue paper. What it does is amplify humming. You could use humming, but it's not very loud. These things get loud. Or they could, you can ask them to sing a note on a vowel. What you're trying to do is strip away all the grammar and the individual sounds and just focus on the one kazooish thing. I think there was another way back there. Yeah. How does teaching linking and blending fit into your prosody pyramid? Pardon me? How does teaching linking and blending fit into your prosody pyramid? Very well indeed, but not in a one hour <laughs> presentation. <laughs> linking is where words run together to hold a thought group together. It's a fundamental part. And one reason why linking practice is especially good not only because that's the way we speak in running language, linking the words together, running them together, but if the student has trouble with a final consonant that's never used as a final consonant in their language, it may be used as a, a beginning consonant. It may be they can make the sound. So if you make a slow practice with that sound, the difficult sound, and concentrate their mind on it right there where you're linking it, it can help them 
feel, if it's done slowly, how that sound is made as the beginning of the next. Think about thank you. Thank you. That sound links over. If it's, that's a stop sound, but if it's a running sound, uh, spell easy. Spell easy. And that L may be difficult for people at the end. Maybe it's easier at the beginning. Spell easy. And you're concentrating on that one point. So linking is terrific. I just didn't have time to talk about it today. If you're teaching and learning yourself in a class where there are a lot of different well, community, low beginner, uh, different nationalities, Arabic, Spanish, um, Iraqi. Of course. Now, should, you, should the focus be to teach to English or Jersey English, or should you try to approach it from the problems that, nat that native speaker uh, Arabic have or native speaker Spanish have? You understand what I'm trying to yes. ask? Yes. Well, here's the problem. I have always taught in mixed language classes, and people who teach overseas have a monolingual class. But that's a, something I don't have experience with. I'm always used to having it mixed. So I've spent 30 years figuring out what is the most common problems that everybody has. And it's this musical stuff. And individuals, of course, are going to have some of them are going to have an easier time at particular lessons than others. And when you have students in student pairs, it's best not to have two people of the same language as pairs, because they can read the body language, and they can see the frown or the tension, and then they know, oh, oh, it's that one, which is not the proper signal. <laughs> but it's good to have a mixed class, because what ideally you want them to realize we are all in this difficult problem of learning to be competent at a new language so we can use it for our lives, which is necessary. This is not just an elegant exercise. And that's a good thing. Uh, but you, if, you've, if you spend too much time on one individual group's specific sound problem, uh, the other people, you know, it's a, wait a minute, how about us? But these musical things, it's important. They can be French, they can be Japanese, whatever. Their, their language is not using this prosody pyramid system. Uh, yes, I, I just wondered, forgive me if this is something that you and we all know about already, but uh, I recently had some experience working with someone who had a, a, an almost incurable stutter. And by speaking with them at the same time, to their utter astonishment, they suddenly found for the first time in their lives they were able to speak in exactly the same way that I do. And um, I wondered if the business of speaking with people when you're exploring any of these issues had developed similar results for you. I have never heard anybody talk about that because I'm not in speech pathology. But it makes sense to me, because this whole thing about choral repetition being a support uh, makes sense. And the thing, as I understand it, about stuttering is there's a timing problem. And, and let me go to a whole different pathology, which is aphasia, when someone's had a stroke and lost the ability, because of a particular part of their brain, to put together grammar connections. Often, there's something called intonation therapy. Often, if it's a song, they can glide along with it, particularly if it's a song they knew before the accident or whatever. And so there's tremendous power in this idea of learn like a little song. So it makes sense to me what you're saying. do that to students. I've been lucky enough to have students that were from different language groups, so I deliberately put them together. But what is your response? I've had people say, well, I didn't understand what he was saying. He wasn't speaking clearly enough. And so, I mean, I, I keep putting them together. I don't, that doesn't stop me. But what is an, a way of <laughs> helping them understand that or bridge that so that they're not quite as sort of, it's the other person's fault, which it 
may or may not be. Do well, you understand what I'm saying? It might be yes, a Spanish-speaking person. But they or need the to learn Chinese to accommodate. Speaking. Yeah. And that's why just having the teacher or just having a recording doesn't teach them to accommodate to different accents, different Goodness knows, different parts of the U.S., the accents are different, and they're hard to understand for those of us who don't live there. But this is a psychological thing, to get over the idea that there's a one right way, and this other person is making my life hard. Which, of course, is what they will run into instantly when they go to, at least in California, the Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> But it's very common for people to say, oh my God, I can't understand this person isn't speaking English. And they'll run into that a lot. And this is very hard on a person. But for them in a mixed class, this is an ideal way to learn to accommodate to variations. If it's roughly speaking, now the thing is, if the emphasis is in the right place, you can guess what's around it. If the emphasis system is not used, and you're going by individual sounds, uh, that's, that's too hard. Um, I've, always, I've always heard that you should worry more about your pronunciation than your accent, and you're in a way speaking about this right now, but I, I, don't, know, I don't know that I can actually tell the difference. I mean, could you, could you I maybe... I don't know what you mean. Like, what's the difference between an accent and pronunciation? I've always kind of thought of them as two separate things, like, oh, this person has an accent, but they pronounce properly. Do. My but gosh, th my nieces from Ohio think we in California have a funny accent. <laughs> That's the human nature. Other but, people's way of speaking but is But so is pronunciation part of the accent, or are they separate things? That's, I don't know if I'm asking this clearly. My concern is can people make themselves understood? And anything fancier than that, the teacher sets up for disappointment and burnout. Has an <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, um, it helps an awful lot. You, we cannot make them sound like native speakers. That's a terrible swamp of despair for teachers and for the students. It's a, just a disaster. And a lot of people feel that's their job. And the students feel they failed if they didn't. Well, they're not going to ever sound like native speakers. It's not natural. I told you, we all, I believe this, we learned to speak by the time we're a year old, the main points of it. And the, the, the task is to learn when you're trying to speak with a native speaker. This would be true whether you're speaking any other language. If you're speaking to a native speaker and they don't understand what you just said, you've got to know what is it that I could fix to make it a little easier for them. Because if I make it too hard for them, I've lost my chance at whatever this transaction was supposed to be. So I need, I need to have a way to Fix the main things. And if you can convince them of that, this is not a matter of getting rid of your accent. People are always talking about linguistic imperialism and such. If they have, a, I get very cross about that because if they have a need to use English for some purpose of their own in their life, then it's our job to help them make it easier for the person they're speaking to. It's not good or bad, but practical. Okay, I think okay. we'll wrap up there. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Judy. <laughs> Thank you.